As Wayne mentioned when he opened this day today, we're so glad to have you here with us today. This is actually the third annual Open Access Day celebration that we have done at Open Access Week at the library. And every year we give an Open Access Award. Um, and here to present the award is Mark Stover, Dean of the Library. So this is one of the uh, most enjoyable parts of my job when I get to give away um, honors and awards and money. Um, I, I, uh, I was telling somebody earlier, I almost feel like Ed McMahon with the publisher's clearinghouse, you know, because you, <laughs> um, you, you'll get the joke when you see the size of the check. But, uh, <laughs> um, but um, in all seriousness, um, th this is, uh, there was a lot of thought that went into the selection of the awardee, and um, you know we, we take this process really seriously because we believe, uh, many of us believe very strongly in the idea of open access and and open data and open repositories. So I first want to thank the award committee um, this year, made up of Elizabeth Altman, uh, Chris Bullock. Andrew Weiss and Martha Steele. Could you uh, four please stand so we can recognize you? Martha Steele's outside, I think. Yeah. So the award committee, the selection committee, um, I think made a great choice this year. I thank them for their hard work um, in spending time deliberating on and making the final selection. So, um, Why did, we, uh, why did we choose Professor Stephen Dudgeon for this award? Well, for many years, Professor Dudgeon has been, uh, who's a professor of uh, biology here, has been a strong advocate and an early adopter of data management and data management planning at Cal State Northridge. He's recognized the importance of open data and uh, rep replicability and because of this, he himself has archived um, much of his own experimental data in different repositories, including our own ScholarWorks repository at CSUN, as well as the Ecological Society of America um, ecological archives. And since Dr. Dudgeon's work in evolutionary, psych uh, sorry, evolutionary ecology is related to global warming, which is, as we all know, a worldwide problem that requires international cooperation. The openness and the availability of his data has become even more essential as the impact of climate change grows. Over the past five years, Professor Dudgeon has worked together with Oviatt Library staff and faculty on several different projects, including his uh, National Science Foundation and his NIH grant proposals uh, presentations on data management, as well as a library produced video on the benefits of uh, digital preservation and self archiving. So I'm pleased to honor Dr. Dudgeon this year with the third annual CSUN Open Access Award for his advocacy and his actions in the area of open data. This award comes with a check for $500 and a certificate of merit. Dr. Dudgeon, congratulations. So first, check. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Here's your Please, one more round of applause for Professor Dutchin. And I think that um, it's time for um, Chris Bullock, who's a member of the library faculty, to come introduce our afternoon keynote speaker. Okay, 
Um, thank you everyone for continuing with us into the afternoon. And so for our next speaker, um, you know, we're really going to be talking about some of the concerns related to, to data and data sets that are kind of near and dear to librarians' hearts. Because we've heard about people who are using data sets and people who are generating these wonderful data sets. And when we think about data as, and data sets as research objects, there's so much that goes into you know, preserving them, um, into making them shareable, citable, you know, you know, really tracking kind of the impact of those data sets. And our next speaker, uh, Trisha Cruz, who is the executive director of DataSite, has really worked on a lot of those issues with the California Digital Library, DataSite now, and also Data One. And so, without further ado, I'll introduce Trisha Cruz. I had, I went around and around on what to title my talk, and I would have changed it five times, except my computer was up here. And I sort of think the title of my talk should be, come on, don't you want credit for your data? And that's really what DataSite is all about, is getting credit for all of the hard work um, that people put into creating their data sets. So what I want to do today is, in my talk is um, talk about why data is important and what role it plays in scholarship. And I think you've already kind of touched on a lot of these things today. But I'm going to look at it kind of from a higher level. Um, and um, uh, what DataSite is, and, and that's the organization I work for, and um, who are the communities that we work with and, and benefit from, from DataSite. Um, and then take a closer look at some of the services that DataSite provides in support of um, um, data sharing and um, in, for scholarly communities. And finally look at how we're integrating with other services and across platforms to really kind of bring data up to that first class citizen in, in the scholarly record. And just a little sidebar, when I talk about data, um, it includes a lot of different things. It can um, also included in that can be software, um, scripts, um, images, uh, and et cetera. So you'll get a little bit better idea of that. So a little bit about me. I used to work at the California Digital Library, which is um, a library that works collaboratively with the 10 campuses of the University of California. And um, so I'm a librarian by trade, and um, I've worked in the government documents field and um, census data. Um, I've also worked a lot with digital information for years and years. Um, but most recently at the California Digital Library, I developed something called the UC Curation Center, um, with working with UC faculty to think about how to manage and preserve their data. Um, um, and so that's, it's really required me to, throughout all of these jobs, to wear a lot of different hats and um, to uh, think, uh, try and think like a researcher and help to meet their needs, but also um, bring those kind of librarian skills to the forefront. Um, at DataSite, it's a really small organization, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that is in a minute. Um, but um, being a small organization, again, I have to wear a lot of hats. I'm a, um, I am a, a communicator, a marketer, a, a grant getter, um, a, a bureaucrat, an administrator, a handholder, a traveler, all of those different kinds of things. So today I'm going to talk about data. And um, all, as we all know, um, data is everywhere. Big data, little data, long tail data, small data. Um, somebody, there was a, a biggie data I think I heard today, biggish data, um, data management, open data, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that um, when I was at the California Digital Library that I was involved with in was developing something called the DMP tool, or the Data Management Planning Tool. And um, so from that perspective, thinking about how you manage that data over time. Um, and it, data is a really hot topic, and it's um, impacting how we work um, and the things that we work on. And throughout my career, I've really um, been uh, always working in an environment where the people I work with are um, impacted by constant change, where that changes in technology, um, and, and their needs are changing, et cetera, and their funding is changing. Um, and so big data is in the popular press, but also it's in the scholarly press. Um, there's even a, a TV show on data. This is a German TV show that talks just about data, sports data. Um, and then uh, just recently, I don't know if some of you heard um, Vice President, President Joe Biden on NPR a couple weeks ago, where he was talking about the, um, how data can be shared and help um, to cure cancer. And that's his, 
is one of the initiatives that he's working on. But data has always been a part of scholarship. Um, so let's take ourselves back to the early 1600s and sit down with Galileo at night as he pulls out his microscopes and points it um, towards Jupiter. And he um, also pulls out his lab notebook and he records um, the date and um, some moons, um, and, or the planet Jupiter and some points of light around the moon. And he labeled each drawing um, um, with the date. Eventually, he used these um, observations to conclude that the Earth orbits the Sun, just as the four moons orbit Jupiter. And history shows um, that, that Galileo was an amazing astronomer, obviously, but he was also an amazing data scientist um, in that he, what he did um, in 1600, we can understand what his methods were then and communicate those today. So the data being the drawings of Jupiter and its moons, um, the metadata, timing of each observation, and the text describing um, the methods and analysis. So summing up the problem is um, research data forms the foundation of scholarship. Um, just as the Galileo story illustrates this, I want to iterate, reiterate this just because it's at the very core of what data site's mission is. Out of data comes more data, software, publications, conference proceedings, presentations, and posters. I think that we've all been a part of these various things. And collecting and managing that data is nothing new. Um, but yesterday's form of manual data collection has been replaced by collecting digital data. And digital data has presented an enormous challenge to the research community, particularly if research data are not managed properly. And in order for research, um, for further, in order to further research, we need reliable, persistent, and unambiguous access to research data in order to support um, proper attribution and credit. So everybody gets credit for the good work that they do. To support collaboration and reuse of that data, and to enable reproducibility of findings. And to foster faster and more efficient progress. And finally, to provide the means to share data with researchers into the future. And one thing that I think is really important to note is these are not just technical issues, but these are also social issues. Um, when you talk about um, some of the genome data and sequencing data, there's huge technical issues with that, but also the, the, the social issues of sharing data that we heard about um, earlier today when somebody said, well, I, I only got two papers out of that and somebody got five papers and a prize. You know, how um, some of those things that impact when you, when you come to share data. So data site's approach to, um, to this is to work on two fronts to meet these challenges. Um, first, we've created a, a technical infrastructure that allows users to create um, digital object identifiers and metadata for their research needs um, and services that, that support data sharing. And I'll talk a little bit more about those. And then integrating those services with other communities. And the second thing we do is provide um, a community and social infrastructure that works to change communities of practice. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So our mission is a simple one, is to help the research community locate, identify, and cite research data with confidence. You want to be able to say, yes, that is the data set I need, or that's the data set I authored, and that's what I'm going to reference, or that's who's referencing me. So a little bit of a snapshot of data site. Um, we're a nonprofit um, global, global organization. Um, we have a... Um, members of 40 members worldwide and it's really community driven and when I say that it's a membership organization and the members really drive what it is that we do. We're discipline agnostic. We work with the social science community, the science community, the humanities community, etc. As long as it's data we're happy to help people um, manage that data over time. Currently we work with 900 data centers around the world and again, those are really a diverse set of data centers. Um, and to date, we've created over 8 million DOIs that are being shared by the community. So DOIs are central to DataCite and allow DataCite to provide services in support of data sharing. And how many here know what a DOI is? Yay. Um, and obviously, the more data you generate, the harder it becomes to manage that data, particularly if it's, it's um, heterogeneous data and it's um, in a lot of different places. And that's where the DOI system comes in. Digital object identifiers offer several advantages to the research community. And they can identify content permanently. 
Um, and the DOIs are coupled, when the DOIs are coupled with metadata, they can be modified over time to keep track of both the locations of, and the characteristics of the data they identify. Um, a DOI persists as ownership changes, as legal parameters change, et cetera, um, as metadata and location of, of the object change. The core functionality of the DOI is to resolve the DOI to a registered and persistent um, and updatable URL. So down in the weeds, um, looking at this kind of from a research perspective, you take a data set, you describe it, you assign a DOI to that data set, um, and then you can reuse and reference that data set, um, and then enjoy the benefits of once that is out, that data set is out in the wild with an um, identifier. And I'll talk a little bit about um, what those benefits are. It be can become findable, um, reusable, you can track the citations, and you can measure the impact of that data. So at DataCite, we're incredibly proud of all of our, of our data of our data sets, um, um, and we're incredibly pr proud of supporting open research and open data and open science. And over the past several years, data site DOIs have been assigned to millions and millions of research um, data sets. And all of these um, data sets are an important step towards making data a first-class citizen. But some of them, I think, are um, um, deserve a little a round of applause and um, deserve to be highlighted. And the first is the Higgs boson um, out of CERN. This is a publicly available data set. Um, and if you go to these URLs, you'll get to the, um, the data sets that supported the Nobel Prize um, in physics in 2013. And the other is data from LIGO, uh, the laser infer inferom I can never say that word, inferometer, gravitational wave observatory from Caltech MIT, um, which was in the news quite a bit last year. And again, this is also a data set that that's, has a DOI citation. So now that I've shared with you, um, with you the um, centrality of data in, in the research message, mission and um, the challenges presented by data uh, for data intensive research and what DOIs are and data site, I want to move a little bit and talk about what um, our core services are beyond assigning those DOIs and beyond um, uh, creating metadata to accompany those DOIs. First is our search service. Um, so this is one of our core services. When a researcher creates um, a data set and assigns that DOI, um, which you can see right there, um, all of that um, data, metadata is pushed to our central registry and it's available for search. Um, and uh, so you can see the DOI there. Um, and then accompanying that is uh, you can facet and browse um, by different ways. And then I'll talk a little bit more uh, how that is, is exposed further. We also, um, site is a really, really important thing, as our name implies, data site, get it? Um, and uh, so we really uh, think that this is an important way um, to make data part of the scholarly record. Um, and so creating those uh, easy way for people to cite their data um, and, um, and, and to be able to um, give people credit. Um, so one of the things that we really look to are some of the, the um, things that are generated by the community. So the Joint Declaration of Data Citation Principles, the Force 11 data principles, they kind of lay out what are the really important things to think about when you're citing data. Um, and, I, and I think all of you will agree that I'm not going to read through these, but um, and this is something that, that we kind of look to as our guidebook um, for data site when we're, we're thinking about citation. Um, and number four, unique identification. Um, number two, credit and attribution. Um, so data citation should facilitate giving credit to all of those that were involved in creating a data set. And number seven, specif um, so specif specificity and verifiability. Um, so you can, again, go exactly to what data set you need, you need to cite. So another service that we have is something called the um, DOI Citation Formatter. Um, so when you submit something to a journal and you want to figure out what, um, how you should cite your data set, um, you can enter your DOI in there, and then there's a drop-down list of over 8,000 citation styles, and it'll pull up, and then you, you're sure that um, you're, uh, you're in line with what um, that particular journal um, wants you to cite. One of the things that we also want to do is not just create our own search index for our data sets, but we want to open those up so anybody can use those. 
Um, so um, we want to create downstream impact um, of, of the data sets and make them available to as many people as possible. And so all of the um, data um, records are available by OAI PMH and, and can be harvested using different um, metadata formats. And it's open and free. And we have a lot of people who use this, Thomson Reuters, um, the Data Citation Index, if some of you have heard of that. Elsevier uses it through Ex Libris, um, SHARE, the Center for Open Science uses it through SHARE. So again, once you put a DOI on something, it can really explode and, and get out into the community and be used by, by tons and tons of people. So now we're, I, I think we're getting to the exciting part is um, thinking about service integration. It's fine enough to say, okay, I'm going to put, I'm going to get a, a DOI, I'm going to get some metadata, fine. It'll be searchable in the catalog. But thinking about that next step, and I think service integration is really, really important. Um, there's so many tools available to researchers. There's so many tools available to all of us. It's a completely overwhelming about where you're going to dive in, what you're going to invest in, um, and what rises to the top. What, what's going to be the thing that's going to stand the test of time? Um, and so we're, we, uh, DataCite, take this very seriously about connecting our services in order to make it easier for people to, um, to cite their data, um, to get credit um, for their data, and to integrate it with related content so it provides a fuller picture of the data set. Um, so it's associated with software, it's associated with publications, et cetera. And again, to provide that downstream impact so it's not just a data set that somebody is going to forget about that it so it can be reused and et cetera. So it's really about building bridges um, um, across platforms and building bridges across communities in order to create um, that uh, service integration. One of the ways that, that DataCite has approached the service integration is um, through something called the Thor Project. And um, DataCite has been working on this over the past 16 months. And it's, it's really um, where we're con integrating our services with other services, um, or rather building bridges between all of these various services. Um, and the goal of Thor is to connect people, places, and things. So um, think about that as I kind of go through my next um, chunk of slides. So the Thor project uh, is an EC-funded project. It's about a $4 million project, and it's 30 months. Um, we um, have partners, um, DataCite and ORCID are the main um, persistent identifier um, partners. Um, DataCite is working um, on the Thor project, um, providing DOIs for content. Um, ORCID is providing DOIs for people. Um, how many here have ORCIDs? Anybody? Yay. Everybody should raise their hands. They're good. Um, <clears throat> and so we also work with repositories such as Dryad and Pangaea. Um, we work with really big data centers, CERN and um, EBI, um, the European, European Bioinformatics Institute. Um, and then we work with a, a host of, of journal publishers from Elsevier, but also PLOS. Um, so it's a, a really big project where we're thinking um, how all the services that, that we can provide so it's possible for um, people, um, for authors to get credit through citation. Um, support reproducible research and um, build interoperable services. So we're going to dive in a little bit here um, and kind of go through these various things. So um, the places where we're integrating our services is, um, again, integrating uh, platforms and communities is linking data with data. So, um, so if you have uh, parts of data sets and it's related and there's a new version of a data set, how do you link those things together? What, what makes sense? The next thing is linking data with articles. And um, I would add to that articles plus, um, articles um, and software or posters or, or, or things like that. Uh, linking data with contributors, thinking about who, um, who developed a data set, when they developed that data set, and bringing those things together. And um, the final thing is linking data with institution and funders. And um, this is the kind of the newest thing on the horizon, but I think one of the most exciting. So the first uh, thing is linking data with data. And so this is, a, there was a number of challenges associated with this, and I'm sure many of you in the room are familiar with this. If you have multiple versions of a data set, 
Um, how do you link those things together? If something has been revised, if uh, there was a, a journal article and there's a reference to a, 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 a data set um, in there, how do, you, how do you bring all of those, and there's a newer version of that data set, or there's a, simply a correction, how do you bring those things together? Subsets of larger data sets. Um, a lot of times people who are working with really, really big data um, they s simply want to um, cite a very small portion of that data and be able to, to do that. And also dynamic data, um, things that come from sensors and are constantly being um, uh, a part, uh, being changing all the time. How do you cite that dynamic data? And all of these things really relate to each other, um, but this is one of the things that we're working on um, with our partners, um, with CERN and, and EBI and, and ORCID. So this is uh, going back to our search index that I showed you first. Is um, so here we have an example of linking um, data, um, linking data to data. And so the first top part is um, um, uh, flux data, um, carbon export um, fluxes, and then you see that it has six relations. And then below that, you can see that um, there's. Uh, this data is related to uh, other, other data sets that, um, that link those things together. And so this is all done through um, a related DOIs, and so it brings all of this information together. So if somebody is interested in looking at, uh, and then it will go the other way too. If you look at this data set, it will find this data set, et cetera. So this is also done through um, relationship types. This is in the metadata, um, and if something is, um, a source of, is supplemented by, a new version of, is the original form of. And so there's a lot of different things that you can, can do here. And I will be the first to admit that we're just taking baby steps into, even though there's 8 million records um, for, data, for, data, um, for data sets, I think that we haven't, as a community, haven't really agreed on what some of these terms mean. And so I think this is an area where we need to really say, well, what does it mean? What is a new version? What does it mean to supplement something? And so uh, I think the librarians in the room really need to get together with the, the um, with researchers and say and and come to come together on some of those things. Here's another model or another example of linking parts um, data parts using metadata, um, and here is um, something from Pangaea, um, which is in Germany, which uh, is uh, a lot of earth science data, and um, you can see that this um, data set at the top has um, 4,775 related parts. And so this is a really good way, so if you have these really huge data sets of kind of bringing all those different parts together in one, using kind of those DOIs and linkages. Okay, now we're gonna shift a little bit to thinking about linking data with articles. And um, so this came out of a project that I worked on with um, the Data One community um, and PLOS when I was at the California Digital Library. Um, and we had an NSF grant to think about um, something called uh, making data count. And uh, so we really, one of the things that we wanted to do was to illustrate what the linkages were between um, data sets and, and other publications. So some of the challenges that, that we discovered in that was that data underlying findings described in a manuscript are not always um, fully available. In a manuscript, you might see just a, a, a cute little picture of a, of a piece of data or a, or a table or something like that, but that's not the whole data. It will um, refer to it, but you can't really get to it. And the underlying um, findings described in the manuscript are made available, available but hidden in supplementary inf in, uh, information not um, easily findable. And again, I think this is one that some of you have probably experienced. Or the, um, it's, but not, or the data underlying defined described in a manuscript are made available, but not properly linked. So they're just both floating around in the, in, in the world, and you can't really say, oh, these two things go together. This is, the, this is the data set that this person was referring to when they wrote their journal article. So wouldn't it be nice if um, when a data publisher, a researcher, is automatically inf informed when their uh, journal article cites one of their data sets. That would be terrific. It's like, hey, somebody just uh, cited one of your data sets in this journal article. Here's credit. You did great work. So again, kind of going back to um, thinking about uh, 
some of the community principles that are emer emerging. As a um, community organization, DataSite really looks to things like this, such as the FAIR principles. Um, and the FAIR principles are, are just coming out, um, and they're still under comment with Force 11, the data sharing principles. And <clears throat> they're pretty simple, and I think that they're a very good step into thinking about, OK, if I want to share my data, what are some of the things that I need to do? And first, it needs to be findable. You need to describe your data um, and, and put it in a data repository, port, repository and apply a persistent identifier to that data. You know, that's, I, I, I didn't say that. Somebody else said it, and I'm glad they did. Um, it needs to be accessible. Um, consider what will be shared. If it's proprietary data, it has sensitive information to it, maybe it's not something that can be shared. Um, and, but you need to state why it can't be shared. Um, and use open formats. Don't use proprietary software or things that, that people aren't going to be able to get to or um, have only uh, a very short shelf life, et cetera. And use common metadata standards, things that, that the community can, uh, is familiar with and, and can understand. And then finally, be re, must be reusable. Consider um, permitted access apply appropriate licenses. And we talked a little bit about this earlier when somebody was talking about the CC0 license. So again, um, linking data with articles. Uh, this goes back to a lot of the work that we did um, on the Making Data Count project. Um, there was a project out of PLOS called Article Level Metrics. So um, when we got our NSF funding, we developed data level metrics with PLOS. And um, this is to think about what metrics are involved in, and um, how you measure the impact of, of data sets. Um, so we have uh, developed a piece of software called Legato. Um, and it's data site event data. And then we work also collaboratively with Crossref, who provides DOIs for journal articles um, of thinking about um, how you collect and aggregate and make available the data and the links that surround a particular data set. So here's my first example. Here's a, a journal article. And um, the journal article is from the American Chemical Society. And it's uh, five data sets are linked to that um, same article. So again, it's really bringing those two things together. So um, if it's, this is a, a great way to get credit for your research. So if you write a journal article and you cite somebody else's data or your own data, there's a way to do that and to connect those pieces. Um, and this is one that we're um, really excited about, is um, taking a journal article, and in this case, it's the, um, the open journal, and it's a journal, um, and it's citing a, a software library. And we are just um, reissuing our metadata schema to um, include um, things that are really software friendly, so people can cite software that relates to a data set or is used um, as part of a data set. So again, bringing those two things together. So the third example here is um, looking at um, PLOS and um, saying, OK, can you just show me all of the data sets um, that are linked to out of PLOS? And so if you want to see, see that kind of thing. OK, so moving on is linking uh, data and contributors. So some in the room are, have um, ORCIDs. And so this is, again, is uh, linking to not just a single contributor, but many contributors. Whether um, And there's a lot of debate in the community of who actually has contributed to a data set. Is it the sysadmin? Um, is it just the PI? Is it the postdoc? Is it you know who all gets credit? Um, when you are linking data to contributors. And I'm, I'm not going to, I don't have an opinion on it other than to say it's a really complicated issue. So, one of the things that DataSite has, has done is work on seamless integration um, with, uh, with ORCID. And there's many tools and services out there, as I said earlier, and, and integrating we take very seriously. But ORCID is one that I think is very, very important. Um, is allows researchers to uh, obtain a persistent identifier their name, um, for themselves and therefore disambiguating them from anybody else and uniquely identifying themselves. And so we worked with ORCID and, and Crossref on this. So Crossref has this same functionality. 
And um, so researchers use their ORCID ID when submitting a data set and they authorize data site, data site to update their ORCID records. So this all happens automatically. And um, then uh, data centers, so if you're working with a repository or something like that, they collect ORCID identifiers and embed that ORCID identifier in the published work and as part of that metadata. Um, and then data site automatically pushes that information um, to the researcher's ORCID record. So again, going back to that data site search, um, if you look here, you'll see that, um, that uh, is, so some of these records, this is my colleague Martin Finner, he, um, some of these, are, this is his record, is already in his ORCID record, and this is saying, oh, here's a new one, do you want to add this to your record? So this is a manual procedure, or it just, you can push it automatically. And so then if we went to Martin's ORCID record, you would see all of these um, data sets have been automatically added to ORCID, his ORCID record. So now the last thing that I want to talk about is um, linking data um, to uh, funder information and to other organizations. Um, <clears throat> and so one of the things that we've done at DataCite is um, added new um, properties to our metadata so people can add funder information to, to, their, um, to their metadata. Um, and it's, there's new sub-properties, et cetera. And there's something called Open Funder Registry, which is identifiers for, um, for funders. And so those can, auto, those can be added to um, a metadata record. So this is really important, particularly for funders, because they want to see what's the impact of, of my funding. If they can say, show me you know, this, the bio, bio um, program and uh, how many, uh, how many data sets have formerly been published or something like that. This is a way to be able to do that. So the next thing is um, leaking uh, data to organization identifiers. And this is, um, when I was at the University of California, this was extremely important within the university to say, why can't we be able to search um, by institution to say, what is, um, what, what, how many data sets have, has been produced, et cetera. This is a, is a huge one. And there's currently no system to be able to do this at all. There's um, little bits and pieces here and there. Um, <clears throat> so Crossref, ORCID, and DataCite are forming a, a new uh, organization um, in a couple of weeks in Reykjavik, Iceland of all places, where we're um, forming an, an organizational ID registry. And the idea is pretty simple, is thinking about, you know, we have content identifiers, so you can put identifiers with, um, with content such as data sets or journals. Um, you have contributor identifiers with, through ORCID, but there's no organizational identifiers that kind of puts that, that completes that stool. So you can say, okay, this person belongs to that institution. That data set came from that institution, belongs to this person. I mean, you kind of need that whole thing to be able to pull all that information together. And so um, we're hoping to have um, move something forward um, after the first of the year and, and really move um, forward on this. And, and uh, so one of the other things that I want to include in this, and it's one of my uh, pet peeves, is to be able to include project um, identifiers of sorts. Um, having been on the Data One project, which is um, working with Bill Michener through the University of New Mexico, um, people come and go off of that project. It has different cycles of funding. It could move to a different institution. Again, you need to be able to track a project and that funding agency, the organization, et cetera, and again, pulling all that information together um, so the organization gets credit, so the, the researcher gets credit, um, and the project gets credit. So this is kind of what it looks like um, of, of connecting a researcher to an organization, um, to that, that data set or project, um, to the funding mechanism, um, and to those journal articles and, and different outputs. So really kind of creating those, those links across that whole life cycle of, of data. So one little thing that I want to mention that doesn't fit so well into that story is thinking about repositories. Where do you put your data? Um, and this is something called RE3 data. Um, and this is also a data site service. And um, we've learned along the way, and, and, um, and just from my experience in talking to researchers, um, they have no idea where to put their data. Um, when, they, when they're told by a funding agency, well, you need to put your data in a repository and you need to share it, I think, well, where do I put it? 
Um, and re 3 data is, can really help with that. Um, it's a searchable and browsable registry of over 1,400 data repositories. Um, and it includes a huge range of disciplines, including um, yeah, you know, the, the sciences, social sciences, humanities, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that, that I like about it is that it's um, uh, operated and, and curated and updated by librarians. And they take their job very seriously. And it's uh, 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 from all over the world as well. And here's a sample record. I don't think you can see it um, too well, but it's, a, it's browsable by subject. And it'll tell you things about, um, does it require DOIs? Does it um, have a data seal of approval on it? There's all different kind of things that you can do to, to better understand what the repository is and if it will fit your needs. So we talked about um, kind of the services and the, the technical infrastructure that DataSite um, provides. And I think the next um, really important thing that we do is providing um, that, that um, advocacy and outreach um, and to make sure that people understand what happens when they share their data so they're not scared um, to share their data and they don't think they're going to um, uh, be ripped off and scooped and all of that kind of thing. Um, and really to change those communities of practice. And so we um, have several different goals in, in doing that. Um, we, uh, we're a very small organization. As I said, we're only four people, um, well, 4.5. And uh, so we, we, we do a lot of, uh, of traveling and phone talking and webinars and conference attending. And, um, but it's, it's, it's hard when you're such a small staff. Um, but we work uh, very actively through, through the, our members to help spread the word of, of what DataSite is. Um, we have a blog that um, covers all different kinds of things, and I encourage you to follow along on that conversation. We also have um, webinars uh, every single month that range on topics on how to cite dynamic data, um, what's the role of, of um, Python and, and your scripts, and, and, um, but also different things about um, what's a good way to communicate with researchers, et cetera. Um, we also um, have something called a Knowledge Hub. Um, and I'm not going to go to it right now, but it, it's um, a place where you can go and think about all, all things related to identifiers. So one of the things that, that is really important when we think about crafting um, kind of our, our community um, uh, uh, outreach is that realizing that everybody comes to comes to these problems with a very different perspective, and we need to really calibrate what we're doing um, to meet a range of, of different needs. Um, some people um, really uh, don't understand data sharing, and you have to do a lot of hand holding. Other people are very much um, wanting to um, jump in feet first, cannonball style. So in summary, DataSite is working on many fronts with many communities to for, um, further data sharing. Um, we, work, we work with researchers to find, identify, and cite research data. Um, we work with those data centers to provide persistent identifiers for their data sets and workflows, as well as, as best practices for data sharing. We also work with those journal publishers um, to um, enable research articles to be linked to the underlying data sets. And this is a really important one, and one that I, in this coming year that I, I um, really want to make more progress on is to really have a standard way that, that um, in the list of citations, um, to have data sets to be able to be cited. And, um, to, uh, and that's a very hard thing to do because journals have their workflows and they don't want to be interrupted in, in how those workflows go. But I, it's a really important one to, to get those um, data citations in those, in those journal articles. And also um, helping funders um, track the impact of their research funding. So um, we do this by um, providing the technical infrastructure, the DOIs combined with outreach, so data can be located, identified, and cited in order to establish easier access, ex increase acceptance, and foster reuse of data, and making it a first-class citizen. But we need you to do that. That's a hand. It's kind of hard to. Till. <laughs> but we need you to help get that message out there and to help um, you know, share your data and, and mark it up and, 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 uh, for the community. So that's the end of my uh, formal talk. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hi.
Um, um, yeah, I don't want to be snarky, and I know that you said you didn't have an opinion on it, on this complexity thing, but um, I am kind of curious, like what are the different sides of the of points of view? Should, should I like make friends with Dudgeon here so that he puts my name on his data set so that I get cited a lot? Or, or Depends on what your tenure and promotion committee says. <laughs> <laughs> Not to get snarky back at you, but. <laughs> Like it seems like there's there's kind of two ways to think about it. Right. On the one hand, if we could kind of promote prosociality, everybody would get along better, and so right. on. On the other hand, if you make the network too densely connected, right. isn't that an actual problem with? Oh, absolutely. And um, so uh, there's something called CASRE, um, uh, Project Credit, that is coming up with a taxonomy of the kind of of um, things that, you know, what kind of credit um, you should give and how that should be included in your metadata record. Um, so that is something that DataSite is looking at. Um, and it's it's pretty straightforward, and I would encourage you to look at it. It's called CASRAI, C-A-S-R-A-I, and um, it's project credit. And it's, um, but I think there is the, the fear of attribution stacking, um, and then you can also have you know, 100 pages of attribution for a data set, which would not be unusual. So I think, you know, as a community, it's something that, that um, and I think it will, a lot of that will go by discipline, um, and um, which I think already happens, is it's, disciplines have different practices when they do attribution. So, um, yeah, so uh, I, I, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to have a, a, a solid answer on that one. Other questions? This might be slightly off topic, so I apologize. Um, I assume most of this at a technological level is implemented, is instantiated in RDF? Or, yes. Okay. It, is, are, I was just checking because I was wondering how old it was. I, I, was, I have RDFA in my web pages. I might be the only one in the CSU who does that, <laughs> even for syllabi and course outlines. Congratulations. Um, for a long time. And I was just thinking it turns 20 last next year. And Owl is 18 is 17 years old. Um, is there something we have done or have not done, either on the academic side or on the professional side, to address some of these issues with those tools, or are they just inherently limited in the way that they're used, or are people not adopted to Sparkle, or just companies don't want to share data? Are they the problem, or does RDF just stink in so many ways? it's not going to be used by lay people like us. Well, I, I think there's a lot, it depends on what you're trying to solve. Um, if you're trying to um, give people credit, you need to be able to have those citations. And it's hard to have a, a and an, a, with an identifier, you can have persistent citations across time. And I think that's hard to do with some other systems. Um, but also different disciplines have different practices. And so this is just kind of skimming at the top and saying, you know, what is, what is the simplest things that we can do in order to help people share their data? Okay, because I think when we started this, I'm going back to graduate school here. I think when we started this, maybe we promised too much right. on the website for university, universality right. on the ontological taxonomic <laughs> infrastructure side right or maybe right. the tools just didn't come along well I think does that, your impression match mine or? yeah well I think so, so there's so much change that we're facing I mean the role of software is tremendous and um, you know and, and some of those things and, and how we incorporate that into the scholarly record I think is a really important one um, so right okay thanks. okay Well, I'll ask one. Yeah. Jerry has a question too. And then just uh, you touched on a couple of kind of the big hurdles in terms of um, you know, researchers who have no idea where to put their data, and then also journal publishers who are resistant to you know citing data sets. Um, are there any other like sort of big hurdles or big challenges that you have for data sharing? Yeah, I I was hesitant to put this slide in there. Is um, the reasons people don't share their data. I'm going to get scooped. I don't have the time. 
Um, why should I? Nobody's going to understand my data. My data are special snowflakes. Um, and so I think all of those things are valid, but all of those things you have to say, well, um, if they are special snowflakes, you need to document those. You aren't going to get scooped if you use proper procedures. Um, you need to make the time because it's becoming quickly a mandate. Um, so there's a lot of excuses that we hear from the community. Um, one, of, one of the things that I think is a very valid excuse, um, having come from the University of California, is the f resources and finances to manage your data over time. Um, I think all of us probably work on grants, and once that grant ends, you're on to the next grant. Who's going to pay for that to store that data? Um, at the University of California, they haven't yet to make an investment into um, storing for the long term those intellectual assets that are the outcome of grants other than the journal articles. So um, I think that's a pretty valid one, and I think uh, a lot of academic institutions have been dodging that bullet and, and you know, not stepping up to the plate and saying, yeah, we, we need to really help our faculty and researchers. And I think the woman from biology say, was saying, you know, we need to have servers. Yeah, you do. And then um, she said, we can't even think about archiving. Well, you should be thinking about it. Your tech transfer office should be thinking about it. So anyways, rant. Um, this one's dying. It wouldn't have been the first time I would have been in front of a dying microphone. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I have a two-part question, only loosely related. When I first heard that you were talking, I thought there might have been a typo, and it should have been data, S-I-T-E. Um, in hearing your talk, it leads me to the question that I have been wrestling with in my mind ever since it, the term has been coined, and that is the difference between big data and metadata. I understand the denotative difference. I'm trying to understand the connotative difference. And with that in mind, uh, particularly with respect to your last comment, I'd be very interested in understanding how, or maybe better why, a data site couldn't develop a consortium the same way the University of Michigan has it, for example, ISR with, with the uh, political social research data files they have, right. which is now trending towards about 60, 70,000 data sets. Um, where they simply have membership requirements, and that right. is anything is done gets contributed, not only the data, but the coding and the et cetera, et cetera. So why couldn't um, data CITE or data SITE be that kind of consortium? Well, um, we are in a sense a consortium where we have the 40 members who work in turn work with over 900 data centers um, around the world, and uh, so. Um, that's, I think, that's how we have uh, just from, we started in 2009, um, and uh, so right now we have the 8 million DOIs, and over 30% of those DOIs we got just in the last 12 months. And so we're seeing a phenomenal amount of growth. Um, and so I think it, we are a consortium in a sense, we're a consortium of members who work with those data centers. Um, and I'm not sure that answers your question. And um, uh, so, does that answer your question? Let me. Well, I'm more, I'm more concerned. I'm more concerned about the fact that institutionally, um, I don't see the connection. I see the volunteerism of it, and therefore right. it's a consortium in that sense. But for example, ICPSR has a very simple, and I, I, I'm sure other data sets. I'm so, so ICPSR is a member of data site. And so they get their DOIs from us. Okay. And um, so they, we're just one piece of that story. We depend on people like ICPSR to store that data. We then take that metadata and create a registry and then also create tools that, so that metadata can be shared um, across, across boundaries and with other institutions. So what I hear you saying is that the volunteerism of the particular researchers with particular data sets is only as good as the organization to which those data sets right. are contributed. Right. And therefore, in that sense, it's not really a consortium. It's a membership consortium, but it's not really right. a data right. consortium. Yeah, I mean, and so um, when we bring on new data centers, we have, you know, all kinds of things where you say, we ask the data center to promise that, you know, they're going to keep their data around for good and to follow these policies and practices, et cetera. But it's, 
you know, it's it's um, our it's only the the luck that will that'll help that persist. But that's one of the things with a DOI is if um, that data center does go away, we can move that data elsewhere and then continue that um, make that continue to make that persistently available. So, other questions? Yeah. I was <clears throat> I was wondering about the the data repositories and uploading uh, big data sets. Is it preferable to have cleaner data sets or just upload whatever um, data sets or data you've collected? Well, that's a million dollar question. So um, when I was at UC, um, we uh, at first we wanted perfect. And then we realized that people were too busy and didn't have enough resources for perfect. And so we really took what we could get. And um, often the metadata was imperfect. And um, we would think, well, you know, down the line, um, if, there's any, uh, if there's a lot of need for that data, then we can go back and correct that metadata. But we felt it was better just to get it in a repository and keep it in a safe place. So that was our strategy. Other questions? All right. Well, join Thank me you. in giving a hand for Trisha Cruz then.